the earliest Christians didn't read the biblical stories. They heard them or they told them themselves. They learned them by heart and told them out loud to others. We've kind of lost that in this literate age, although as we shift to a digital age, some of these aspects might be coming back. But I'm going to be telling the story today, so it won't look exactly like it looks in your bulletin. I'm using both the New Revised Standard Version, um, the Common English Bible, and then a little bit of my own translation. So um, I just wanted you to, to recognize that beforehand if you're following along. And um, we will hear pieces of this in my sermon as well. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. About this time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens ripped open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You're my boy, whom I dearly love. I delighted in choosing you. And immediately the spirit, the dove, forced Jesus into the wilderness. He was there for 40 days, tempted by Ha Satan, the tempter. And he was with wild animals and angels took care of him. And after John was arrested, Jesus returned to the Galilee, proclaiming God's good news, gospel, and saying, the time is now. The empire that God brings is coming. Change your hearts, change your lives. Trust that this is good news. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 1851, the last decade before the American Civil War. The frontier city of Akron witnesses a woman walk in with the air of a queen up the aisle at that year's Ohio Women's Rights Convention. Her name given at birth was Isabella Bomfrey, but her birth was into slavery. After she escaped at 28 from captivity with her infant daughter in tow, she changed it explaining later that God had told her to leave the city and go into the countryside, quote, testifying the hope that was in her. At the Women's Rights Convention, this woman who had escaped the evils of chattel slavery, this woman who had managed to stay alive in a country committed to enslaving her again, this tall, thin, black woman stood up in the midst of a sea of white faces, a few of whom tried to shout her down, who were both uninterested in what she had to say and focused on white men agitating at the same time, it was into this melee that she stood up and gave an extemporaneous speech that would prove her most famous. Ain't I a woman? She said, I can outwork, outeat, outlast any man. Ain't I a woman? The historian Ibram Kendi describes what happens next. As she returned to her seat, she couldn't help but see the, quote, streaming eyes and hearts beating with gratitude from the women, the muddled days from the men. She imparted a double blow with her speech, an attack on the sexist ideas of the male disruptors and an attack on the racist ideas of females trying to banish her. Ain't I a woman? In all of my strength and power and tenderness and intelligence, ain't I a woman in all of my dark skin? Never again would anyone enfold more seamlessly the dual challenge of anti-racist feminism. The speaker's name was now and would be for the rest of her life, Sojourner Truth. Consider that name for a second, Sojourner Truth. 
Lent is a season that relies heavily on both of these concepts. A time when we become a sojourner in the footsteps of Jesus. A time when we seek a truth that Jesus tells us will set us free. A time when we walk our own wilderness journeys. A time when we, like truth herself, testify to the hope that is within us. On that day more than a century and a half ago, I can imagine that for much of her white audience, my ancestors, Sojourner Truth's presence and proclamation both confounded and terrified them, while maybe even showing the promise of a new world, if they could only see it. The Holy Spirit led Sojourner Truth into the wilderness, but it didn't keep her there. That same Holy Spirit takes center stage in our gospel story today, and she is in charge, y'all. In the space of two verses, the Spirit as a dove somewhat calmly announces a terrifying voice from the sky, a voice that brings words of comfort to be sure, but still a voice coming from the sky. And then the Spirit is a wild mystery, physically dragging Jesus on his baptismal day, and dropping him somewhere in the desert, no man's land, cut off from anyone and anything, what the prophets called the wilderness. That was in two verses. That shift. Historically, we Lutherans tend to focus less on the Spirit than many of our denominational siblings. And I believe that's to our loss. In Mark, the shortest and barest gospel we have, we see an immediate and astonishing trajectory driven by this weird, enigmatic, complicated, multifaceted third person of the Trinity in my grandfather's 20th century Catholic tongue, the Holy Ghost. Today, the Spirit is certainly ghost-like, morphing with ease from a fluttering dove, the picture of peace, we release doves to celebrate. They seem very peaceful as they head up into the sky. To a shadowy figure, willing and able to force Jesus into the wilderness at a moment's notice. Immediately, Mark says. And not just for a few nights either, but for almost six weeks. The Spirit comes back for a third act in this short lesson, though Mark doesn't explicitly say so. After John was arrested, Jesus returned to the Galilee, proclaiming God's good news, gospel. Don't sleep on that first part. John was arrested. After John was arrested, John was arrested by the powers that be for speaking the truth, a gift given to Jesus and Sojourner and the rest of us. And that arrest of his cousin drives Jesus out of the wilderness where later, aided by the same Holy Spirit, Jesus will face a similar arrest himself. Barely halfway through the first chapter of Mark, we have three major Holy Spirit job descriptions on display. Comforting us with moments, however brief, of peace. Forcing a sojourn into the wilderness, whether we're ready or not and inspiring truth-telling, regardless of the audience. Sojourner Truth didn't stop with her speech in Akron, of course. Over the next four decades, she continued her spirit-led work through the Civil War and beyond by pressing the U.S. government to provide land grants to those millions who were formerly held captive for generations known to history as 40 acres and a mule, a promise for reparations for a quarter millennia of chattel slavery yet to be delivered. Now, whether or not we as Lutherans choose to focus on this same Holy Spirit, she is most certainly focused on us. The Spirit cajoles us, challenges us, empowers us, not just during Lent, but maybe it's here, where we can see her most clearly. This liturgical season, this sojourn seeking the truth that pro Jesus promises us will set us free. 
Historically during Lent, the church has encouraged giving something up or in recent years to take something on. I think this might be, I think we might be asking the wrong thing. In Lent, we are confronted with a wily, unpredictable Holy Spirit, a divine being who takes us for a ride but never leaves our side. This spirit that encounters us just as she did Jesus of Nazareth and Sojourner Truth, today she lovingly drives us into the wilderness of Lent and into a full Lent where we are continued, we are continuing to experience a global pandemic. She drives us into this wilderness of Lent, but she will not keep us there. The Holy Spirit led Sojourner to leave the wilderness to fight against slavery and the deeply embedded racism of this country. Jesus left the wilderness to proclaim God's kingdom come for the chains to be broken, for the enslaved to be set free. I think the question we need to ask ourselves for this Lent is, what will our sojourn look like? And where will we go after the wilderness?